Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of a world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Exodus, the 20th chapter. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, 
Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Where do you go? Where do you go to meet God? Where do you encounter God's living presence in your lives? Now, I can ask that question like a good Lutheran. Where does God meet you? Today's scripture stories give us some examples of people encountering God. Let's take a look at the three stories and see what we find. First, there is the story of Moses meeting God on the mountaintop. It's an encounter made famous in Cecil B. DeMille's motion picture, The Ten Commandments. Moses ascends the mountain and God descends upon the mountain in a great cloud to give Moses the words of the Ten Commandments. It's unclear if Moses encountered God's audible voice on the mountain, if God's speaking reverberated deep within Moses' consciousness, or if God's holy presence somehow communicated the words in a way that we just can't explain. But the Bible makes it clear that before, excuse me, the Bible makes it clear that Moses met God up there on the mountain, and Moses left carrying the two stone tablets with the law etched on them. This kind of divine encounter, it falls into the remarkable category, right? It's the kind of experience that some of us think we need to have in order to reach some kind of Christian nirvana. But most of us, most Christians, we're never going to have that kind of Hollywood-worthy encounter. It's just not going to happen that way. Most of us are not going to find God on the mountaintop. We're not going to hear God speaking directly to us. So then, where do we find God? Where can we say with confidence that God meets us? Let's, let's turn to the second scripture lesson for today. The reading is from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And Paul explains to the church that, that they can't find God in the ways of the world. God is not found in human wisdom, which implies that that's exactly where the church has been looking for God. Paul explains that God is revealed in what the world labels foolish. I think a little context is helpful for understanding this passage. Corinth, if you've been there, you know this, is a place with many temples to Greek and Roman gods. 
It was a city that was chasing after knowledge and wealth. The Christians that Paul is writing to are in conflict. Some of them feel they are better than the others, smarter, wiser, wealthier, more entitled. Paul is trying to redirect them to the answer that they cannot find in the world's wisdom or markets. Paul instructs them that God's power and might look different than the world's. God's power is revealed in the foolishness of the cross. Like the Corinthians, it can be easy for us to be fooled into following the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom coaches us into living lives that are centered on ourselves, into maintaining power and security, to putting our trust in false idols. Paul, the words of scripture, point us back to the cross that transforms our living and instructs us to live lives of humble service to neighbor. And that brings us to the gospel lesson. For me, it's the gospel story that answers our question. Where do we encounter God? Or where does God encounter us? The Gospel of John starts answering our questions from his opening chapter with the announcement that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he unpacks more of what this means in today's appointed reading. So let's take a close look at it. At this point in history, the temple was the place where God met God's people, God's people being the Israelites. Now, faithful Jews would travel to Jerusalem for all of the special festivals, for special occasions in the lives of their family members, like a birth of a child, to offer a sacrifice at the temple and to receive a blessing from God. The temple was the holy place where God and humans met. When Jesus goes into the temple, drives out the sheep and the cattle, and turns over the money changers' tables, he makes it virtually impossible for the faithful Jews who have traveled all that way to purchase the animals required for sacrifice to receive a divine blessing. Now why in the world would Jesus do a thing like that? In the other three Gospels that tell this story, the reason that's given is corruption. The temple authorities were cheating people, charging high prices for animals and exorbitant exchange rates for temple currency that was needed to purchase the sacrifice. But the reason for turning over the tables that's given in John's Gospel is not corruption. Jesus turns the tables over at the temple in John's Gospel, stops the temple's functions for the day to make a dramatic point, a signal, that God's meeting place is no longer limited to a place of worship or confined within the temple walls. Just pause and think about that for a second in the context of how we are worshiping right now. There's some good news for us today and for the past year. Worshiping in this sanctuary at Christ Lutheran is a rich and meaningful thing. But we know and we believe that God is not contained in the walls of this building. God comes to us through the power and the promise of his word. The word that's Jesus the word that is in scripture, the word that is proclaimed in worship. Now back to Jesus, angry in the temple. A Lutheran professor named Mary Hinkle Shores comments on Jesus in the temple. She writes, Jesus brings temple activity to a standstill in order to point to another holy place altogether. Destroy this temple, 
Jesus says, and in three days I will raise it up. John, the gospel writer, knowing that his readers, that we, might be a little bit confused about Jesus' action, narrates the story for us and explains that Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus is the temple that is beyond destruction. Jesus proclaims that God meets us in his body and in the ways he moves through the world, through time and space in it. The season of Lent is a dramatic season in the life of the church. We follow Jesus' journey, his journey on earth and his physical body on the way to the cross during this season. And we often reenact and retell Jesus' physical steps. On Palm Sunday, we see Jesus riding on top of a donkey to enter into Jerusalem. On Monday, Thursday, we remember him kneeling to wash the feet of his followers. We see him on Good Friday in the Garden of Gethsemane in agonizing prayer, sweat dripping from his body, his closest disciples falling asleep on him. We watch as his body is stripped, beaten, and stretched out on the cross for you and for me, where his dead body is placed in a donated tomb. And it's in that moment, that time between his death and his rising again, that maybe a member of the crowd that was present at the temple or one of the temple authorities thinks to themselves, I remember, I remember the day that Jesus flipped the money changers' tables over, that he talked about the temple being destroyed. Now look, he is the one who is finished. And it's then to their surprise and to our amazement that on the third day, the temple of the Lord, the body of Jesus rises from the dead. In all of these moments in Jesus' life that we highlight in this season and remember in Holy Week, it's Jesus' body that is the point of connection between God and humanity. Consider that those mocking Jesus' beaten body were mocking the body of God. That the women who anointed Jesus anointed the body of God. So where does God meet us? The gospel lesson teaches us that God meets people in the person of Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully human. We encounter God in Jesus who walked this earth in a real body, who ate, who drank, who laughed, who lived and walked and talked with the disciples. In today's scene from the Gospel, Jesus makes it clear that an encounter with the living God doesn't require ascending a mountain, doesn't require entering into a temple built of stone or offering an animal sacrifice. Meeting God. Let me get it right. God meeting us happens in and through Jesus coming into the world with his bodily life, death, and resurrection. God chose. God chose to come down into the world as the Word made flesh. That's what the church calls the incarnation, God coming in the flesh of Jesus. God announces that his dwelling place is with us in Christ. Now, according to the gospel, few, if any, of Jesus' followers actually understood that he was fully God and fully human. They struggled with understanding all of what that meant. Few of them knew that when they dined with Jesus, when they sat at his feet, when they touched his robe, 
that they were encountering the living God. It took time following him, hearing Jesus, encountering him over and over again for the truth of who he was and is to sink in and take root. In fact, it's not until after Jesus' death and resurrection that the disciples remember Jesus' words and they begin to make sense. You and I are often, if not always, the same way. We struggle to understand what it means that God came in Christ Jesus to love us and to save us. We find it challenging to articulate our encounters with God to one another. That's why Lutherans really aren't very good at witnessing or evangelizing most of the time. But sometimes, in fact, most of the time, long after an encounter with God, we're able to look back and reflect and say, oh yes, I remember. I remember and see how God met me in my suffering, how God was with me in my grief. I didn't realize it then, but now I do. Faith, trust, is something that grows and deepens and matures over time. That's why we gather for worship week after week. It's why we follow a three-year cycle of biblical readings so we can hear them again and again and remember the promises. It's why we need to proclaim God's mercy and forgiveness each and every Sunday. We need to remember to let the truth of God coming to us in the body of Jesus Christ come near, sink down in our memory. Some of you who are listening may still be asking and longing for an encounter with the divine. I'll tell you, it could happen on the mountaintop. It could happen in the beauty of an ancient sanctuary or place of worship at that moment when the sun sets on top of the ocean. It could happen in a hospital room in a moment of joy, a moment of suffering. But my job, my call, is to proclaim to you where it does happen, where God promises for it to happen. The truth of where God meets us, where God promises to show up for you and for me, is in the body, in Christ's body. A body that was born of the Virgin Mary, that suffered, died, and was buried, and yes, that rose again. God meets you there. So as we walk this way that we call Lent, let us follow Christ Jesus who came to be destroyed in order to be raised on the third day, that all of us might be one body in and through his body. In him, God meets you. In him, God meets us. No hiking shoes are needed. No special knowledge required. No place of worship mandated. Where does God meet you? In his body. In this body. The church. Amen. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me this 
is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it be ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Please rise. Let us proclaim our shared faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. God, your church, that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God, your Your mercy mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory, renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God, your Your mercy mercy is is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God, your mercy mercy is is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God, your mercy mercy is is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us through this time that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. And we close with a blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you.